audiovisual system right here. He's helping us set up our computer so you can visualize the slides. But we have an excellent lineup of speakers this afternoon. After participating in this session, our participants should be able to define the radiation safety concepts and techniques of importance to interventional pain physicians and patients. Outline strategies to optimize patient safety and reduce risk and complications. Discuss use of contrast agents, classify contrast reactions, and define risk of intrafecal gadolinium. And discuss LRL principles and apply them to your clinical practice. We try to keep this session practical, and I hope you take home points after this session to your practice. At first, I would like to welcome Dr. Kenneth Candido. He's the dir director of um, Pain Practice in Illinois, sorry. Pain Center. Pain Center, Illinois. He is the past chair of the Department of Pain Medicine at Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center in Chicago and clinical professor of anesthesiology and clinical professor of surgery at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. He has a highly visible presence regionally and nationally in the pain management community. He has published extensively in the areas of acute and chronic pain management and has written over 150 original peer reference articles on chronic pain management and multiple uh, textbook chapters um, above 80. <clears throat> he has lectured in both national and international audiences on the complex nature of pain and its treatment. I have a fun fact about Dr. Candido. He has a YouTube channel, does anybody know? Um, so on his YouTube, he has over 270 videos on how to shoot a football into a basketball hoop. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Boyle. Welcome, everybody. Um, first, I want to just express my gratitude for being invited here, and also my gratitude to the great professor, Francis Michael Ferrante at UCLA Medical Center, who was very kind and who allowed me the privilege of borrowing many of his slides for this presentation. So some of this stuff will be repetitive. And I'm going to try not to make this a talk about physics, because I failed physics. I'm going to make this a talk which is practical for you, as well as for your patients. I have no disclosures. And the objectives, of course, are to learn about not just radiation safety, but learn about radiation. Because if you don't know radiation, you can't appreciate what the factors are that we implement each and every day in our practice to minimize exposure to ourselves, to our radiological technicians, and ultimately to our patients as well. A little bit of food for thought, 90% of the average population exposure is man-made. We have available to us tools in our armamentarium to reduce by at least 50% our exposure from diagnostic x-rays. What are those factors? Obviously time, distance, inverse square law, for example. We'll talk about all of those. Collimation, pulse radio frequency and why they are effective. First, you have to understand the photon's journey, for example. Rankin, Wilhelm Rankin from Germany, published the first use of diagnostic imaging, radiological imaging, and of course, shortly thereafter, 127 years ago was that paper, there were the first reports of tissue damage associated with ionizing radiation. We're concerned with ionization, but we're concerned with scatter, limiting scatter from what we do each and every day. The definition of fluoroscopy is a radiological examination utilizing fluorescence for the observation of a transient phenomenon or a transient image. We have photons, particles of light. They travel at the speed of light, they penetrate, they cause ionization, and of course the secondary scatter is what we're trying to limit when we use our tools, when we use our lead aprons, when we use our distance rule, inverse square law, when we stay off the foot pedal, when we use collimation, when we use pulsation in our fluoroscopy. Those are things to limit the scatter, which is a low energy but high length wavelength type of energy. What you see in this picture, there are at least three factors immediately available and under our control to minimize harm to ourselves during the performance of these procedures. Lead adjustable collimators, to minimize the actual electron beam, increasing the source to tabletop distance. So this is kind of counterintuitive, right? Sometimes we put our hands under the, the machine and we want to be able, especially with larger patients, to be able to get our needles in and see what we're doing. So we want the shortest tabletop to detector distance available. 
and again, I, every time I cringe when I tell my x-ray tech, raise the floral machine, because I know what I'm doing is decreasing scatter to myself, to my patient, to my x-ray tech. So three things that are immediately available here, just looking at this cartoon of the CR fluoroscopy unit. We're talking about high velocity electrons. It's an exothermal reaction. They're accelerated at high voltage through a tube. The tube is actually like a glass bottle with the negative cathode at the base of that bottle, a positive anode at the lip or at the mouth of that bottle. And we'll talk about what that entails in just a moment. Radiation is secondary to the electro anode or the positive charge interaction. The anode is made of tungsten and it rotates. So you have to have a, functionally, a functional anode to limit scatter as well. So here are the filament and target. Heat is produced when the electron hits the target and to dissipate heat, you have to have that rotation of the positive anode. Tony, you can stay. Thank you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. X-ray beam is, is polychromatic. Again, for visualization, we need high energy, short wavelengths, but what we're concerned about for harm, for tissue damage, is scatter. Scatter is the thing that we're concerned about. That's low energy, high wavelength. It's the chief source, in fact, of all occupational exposure. So the lead shutters are, in, are inducible. We can trim them down and limit the beam and that's called collimation. Collimation is one of the factors, the seven factors I'm going to talk about to limit harm when we perform fluoroscopy for our patients. And it reduces the field size, of course. So again, the fluoroscopic dish is like a glass bottle. On the flat end of the bottle, or the, bottle, the part that you would stand up if it was actually a bottle on your table, we have the negatively charged cathode. And the cathode has a phosphor associated with it, which generates electrons. They generate through a vacuum, and they are fired through with lenses that help to reduce the beam to the positively charged anode made of tungsten, which helps to dissipate heat and dissipate the scatter associated with our diagnostic imaging. Here you see uh, the input phosphor, which is the cathode, of the negatively charged cathode, and then we have the output phosphor, which is the positively charged anode, and the photocathode converts light photons to electrons. So this is a, an electrothermic process. If you've ever done fluoroscopy, and you put your hand on top of where that tungsten uh, anode is, you feel it gets pretty warm after a period of time. The electrons are accelerated into that anode with a high potential difference, and of course the output phosphor at the neck of that bottle, or at the opening of that bottle on your table, is what converts the electrons to light photons. We're not gonna talk much about brightness, except I know from my own practice when I can't see something and I ask the x-ray tech, can you lighten that up a little bit for me? We do so at a cost. The cost is increased exposure, and that increased exposure of brightness comes at a risk of increasing scatter to ourselves as well. We have a compressive phenomenon due to the lenses that are found inside this bottle, if you will, that are shot through the bottle uh, using a vacuum, and we have something called minification gain, which is the input phosphor uh, at the cathode end down to the output phosphor at the anode end. Uh, flux gain, I'm going to skip a little bit over this. I don't want to go too much into the physics. Brightness gain is minification gain times flux gain. And the brightness gain deteriorates about 10% per year. So maybe you don't know this. Maybe you're using an old fluoroscopy unit. But basically, within about 10 years, those phosphors burn out. And so you have to change your equipment probably at least every 8 to 12 years. You can check the phosphor and you can replace them, but they're extraordinarily expensive to do that. Most authorities recommend just either rehabbing or revamping the entire equipment to buy new equipment. Image quality is contingent upon quantum model, contrast, and detail. The gradient appearance is secondary fluctuations in the X-ray photons. Large changes or reductions in X-ray photons cause a deterioration of your image, and eventually there are insufficient photons for an image. There are two types of, of contrast, subject contrast and detector contrast. This will all be, of course, in your handout, so I'm not going to spend time and, and detract from the other great speakers today. Detail is the sharpness of small structures. We always suggest placing the image in the center of the field to minimize the loss of sharpness. We call that vignetting by putting the actual target when you put your needle on the a subject bone or on the subject anatomical area of interest. We try to place that directly in the center of the field to minimize the process known as vignetting. Distortion is we have something called pin cushion distortion that occurs at the out, uh, outlying areas of the image, so we lose clarity of the image the further we go from the central portion, and that's called pin cushion distortion. Now, what affects exposure? That's what we're here to talk about today, radiation safety. What are the factors that we are known 
to cause a change in exposure to our cells, to our patient, to our x-ray text. Milliamperage, which is the x-ray uh, tube current, and kilovoltage, which is the penetrating ability of x-rays, which improves the quality of your x-rays. So milliamperage, MA, and kilovoltage, KVP, are important constructs. And a 15% increase in your KVP will cause a doubling of your milliamperage. And in general terms, using fluoroscopy, the milliamperage that we're concerned with is about two to five milliamps. Now to compare that to conventional x-ray, if you go in or you send your patient for a chest x-ray, regular radiography milliamperage is about 50 to 1200. So it's multi-factor greater for static imaging than it is for the dynamic use of fluoroscopy, which is a benefit, meaning that we're less exposed to the higher levels of energy. Collimation, we talked about lead shutters, very important. Uh, filtration and fluoroscopy, which is essentially the same as collimation. And exposure time, we obviously don't want to use continuous fluoroscopy anytime you do it. Now, sometimes we have to do it if we're injecting near a vascular structure. We tell the x-ray tech, or we have our foot on the pedal continually. That's the worst thing you can possibly do. And most radiologists or people who talk about radiation safety will tell you never do it, but I realize that in practice that's not always practical. The inverse square law is very important. The further we are away from the source of electrons, the less likely we are, likely we are to have scatter. And the inverse square rule basically says that if you're six feet away from the source, you're getting the minimal amount of exposure possible. Some ways to accomplish this are to use extension tubing, because it's not always practical when you're doing multiple procedures, the set joint injections, the lumbar sympathetic block, which requires vascular targeting, for example. Using an extension tubing can help to keep your hand, your body, your thyroid, your gonads away from the ionizing radiation. The source to the tabletop is very important. We want to maximize the distance from the source to the table and minimize the distance from the image intensifier to the patient. <clears throat> so those are two areas of extreme importance that are directly under our control. Tell, not telling the x-ray tech to continually raise the floor unit is very useful to prevent things from happening that are bad to your cells. If you look at this cartoon here, the, the optimal is again, a very high source to tabletop distance and a very low tabletop to detector distance. Keep this in mind, these are some of the most important factors that you have available to yourself to minimize scatter, to minimize exposure to yourself. These are the seven sources that we have available to us. The seven targets or factors to reduce x-ray exposure. Number one, collimation, we talked about these lead screens. Last image hole fluorosity. Increasing the source to the tabletop distance reducing the distance from the image intensifier to the patient or to the table. Low milliamperage, high kilovoltage, and pulse fluoroscopy. These seven things you should be using in your practice each and every day. Keep your foot off the table, stay six feet away, use lead shielding, for example. How much lead shielding? Well, no less than uh, 0.25 millimeters. We'll talk about that in just a moment. In fact, we're talking about it now. So that helps to reduce the scatter from the patient to yourself. How thick should the shield be? 0.25 to 0.5 millimeters is optimal. At 0.25 millimeters, we reduce 97% of our x-ray exposure. At 0.5 millimeters, we reduce 99% of our x-ray exposure. How's it doing on time here? Okay. Just check. Four more minutes. So rankings are not really important for us. They're a measure, but that's less useful for our purposes than two other phenomena, RAD and REM. We all know what RAD is, we all know what REM are. In fact, they are equivalent concepts in interventional radiology. The RAD is the radiation absorbed dose. The increasing atomic number absorbs more energy, leading to more RADs, radiation absorbed dose, which is equivalent to the radiation equivalent in man. One RAD equals one REM. One REM equals 100 sieverts. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So the amount of energy absorbed per unit mass, the radiation equivalent in man causes the biological effects that we're all aware of. X-rays, gamma radiation, beta particles can cause damage to our tissues. And I'm going to show you which tissues are most likely to be affected. Occupational dose equivalent, we call it in REMs, but you could also call it in RADs, but they're exactly the same. A sievert, one sievert equals exactly 100 RADs. Keep that in mind as well, because that's the metric unit for measuring exposure to radiation. Alara, I'm not going to talk about, I believe Dr. Provenzano has that topic, or, or Dr. Pino. The as low as reasonably achievable, very important concept, all I'll mention is the stochastic effects, which are uncontrollable things outside of our control. There's no threshold for effect versus non-stochastic effects, which where there's a threshold effect may or may not exist. Operator exposure, I told you three times now that scatter radiation is the number one source of exposure to ourselves. 
to our x-ray techs, to our patients and the people in our environment. Try to minimize that. How do we do that with the inverse square law? Stay six feet away from the source of radiation, very important. Finally, protective shielding, 0.25 millimeters of lead reduces our exposure or scatter by 97%, 0.5 millimeters lead by 99%. The lead input covers about 80% of your exposed bone marrow active bone marrow, which is very important. The thickness of the material is very important, but also increases the weight. Obviously, a 0.5 millimeter lead apron is about twice as heavy as a 0.25 millimeter lead apron. And there are four types of monitoring of radiation, a film badge we'll talk about, there's dosimeters. These are the things that you have to use the state and the country demands that you regulate how much exposure you have. A film badge is cheapest, but not as good, not nearly as good as a dosimeter. Obviously, it compares different densities of exposure. The thermoluminescent dosimeter is a lithium fluoride device which traps crystals in water. It's more costly and it's impermanent, but this is a better device and you absolutely must know how much radiation you're being exposed to. Whole body dose, head, trunk, arms, legs, maximum, maximum permissible dose equivalence. This is the most important take home mes message that I have for you today. Whole body is five rems, skin and extremities 50 rems, lens of the eye 15 rems, and pregnant women should not be exposed to more than half of a rem per the entire duration of the pregnancy. There's four types of effects of radiation. The most important is Compton scatter. Compton occurs when a photon bangs into an electron, dissipates heat, dissipates energy, causes a low energy equivalent with a high wavelength. That's what we are exposed to when we're doing our patients' uh, procedures. The dose in the bone marrow is proportional to the leukemia incidence, and the dose in the bone marrow is also proportional to the dose of cancer-sensitive cancer vici. Increasing exposure is a barrier member of the absolute worst upper GI and abdominal angiography. Spermatogonia are most radiosensitive. Mature spermatozoa are radioresistant. Ovary lacks the ability to replace oocytes, and radiation exposure can cause temporary infertility with as little as 30 rads. The dose response is linear and non-threshold to the biological effects and includes the dose rate, the total dose, and the type of cells. Cessation of mitosis with highly dividing cells is what causes injury, both those related to cancer and those related to the bone marrow effects. So what's the most radiosensitive sensitive tissue? Bone marrow, spleen, GI, first trimester fetus. That causes a reduction primarily of white blood cells to a greater extent than red blood cells, to a greater extent than the epithelium, endothelium, connective tissue, bone, and nerves. And there's a latent period I'm finishing in exactly 60 seconds. Carcin no, 30 seconds. Carcinogenesis, the incidence of radiation-induced cancer is the female breast is the most sensitive, followed by the thyroid, followed by hematopoietic cells, lung, GI. Cataracts require several hundred rads, which is a good thing. Shielding, wearing goggles prevents about 85% of that exposure, 90%, and the embryological fetal exposure, 50 rads can cause a spontaneous abortion. And I'm gonna stop right there, hopefully on time. Sorry if I went a little bit over. Thank you for your time and attention, everybody. Look forward to hearing the rest of the talk today. Thank you. Thank you for the detail.